Welcome to Strange Paradigms. In this weekly show, we'll be taking a look into the news and headlines to pick out curious reports of the strange, the weird, and the mysterious. Anything from UFO news to science advancements, the paranormal, and stuff labeled fringe science and fringe phenomena. The topics we cover are fascinating. While some are unnerving and others disturbing, but definitely show that we live in a strange world full of strange mysteries. The idea is for you, the viewers, to be able to offer your thoughts and input on the stories that we cover in the live chat. Each news item we go over in the show, I will put all the links to them in the description box below once this live show is over, as well as chapters on the timeline index. Please make sure to share this video with anyone or groups or forums for those who you think will be interested. The growth of this channel has a lot to do with you, my wonderful viewers and listeners. Before we start, let's say hello to some people in the live chat. Brian, John aside, it is so good to hear that you are doing better after catching the bug. David, Sever, Hides, Kiwi. <laughs> Laura, it is so awesome to see all of you. Dan, hello, 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 everyone. I am so excited that you're here. We have some pretty strange news to cover. But if you are new here, either on the YouTube channel or listening for the first time on your podcast platform of choice, we do three shows a week on this channel. Shifting the Paradigm on Tuesdays, where I interview UFO researchers and enthusiasts. And that's definitely branching out now to also paranormal investigators and um, mathematicians and historians as well. Just hold on. Just hold on to your hats for the next show. You're going to be blown away. Then on Thursdays is Mysteries with the History that I co that Jimmy co-hosts with me from Fade of Black Radio. And on Thursday, we spoke about the Mysteries of India Part 2. There was so much to cover on that country that we had to do a Part 2. We could very well do a Part 3, but we might hold that for a little bit later. And then on Fridays, we have this show right here, Strange Paradigms, where we talk about all the strange news that happened over the week. So... Let's start with our first article, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. For those that are familiar with my YouTube shorts, you might have seen these pictures before, but if you haven't seen any of my YouTube shorts, which are literally very short format videos, informative videos of like 20, 30 to 60 seconds long, take a look at them. Uh, they're pretty fun for a lot of people, especially kids my age. So how many of you have seen this photo. For those listening on your podcast platform of choice, jump over to YouTube because I will be sharing a lot of photos today. And also this show is live. So make sure to come over to the YouTube channel on Fridays at 3 p.m. PST. So for those here looking on YouTube, how many of you have seen this photo? And if you haven't seen this photo, what does it look like to you? What is going on? We are seeing a skeleton buried deep into the earth. And then we see this sickle right over the neck. We're going to get into detail on what the heck is going on here. I have some other photos to share with you. Here's a an aerial view of the skeleton and the sickle. But... It's um, rather frightening. Now, when it comes to being an archaeologist, right, they, they dig up skeletons all day, every day. Now, they, they probably don't, but frequent enough to where it doesn't scare them. If it was me, and I'm just like casually digging into my backyard, which I don't have, but if I were to have a backyard and I came across a skeleton, yeah, I'd be calling 911 first. <laughs> Definitely. What about you? If you were just casually digging up the ground and you come across a human remains, yeah, what would you do? Calling the police would be my my first thing. David, you are ahead of the game. He says it's a sickle blade, so if they try to get up, it cuts off their head. That's so right. It's a very fascinating article. So <laughs> let's get into it. John Aside said, <laughs> I call Buffy. <laughs> Absolutely. You have to. 
Because, I mean, Ghostbusters, they can't help you in this situation unless somehow there's a ghost attached to the skeleton. Then maybe. Cecile, hey there. How's it going, Ray? I would cover up the skeleton. But then would you be a part of hiding the body, making you like a, a culprit to the murder, for instance, right? I don't know. See, that? that's where my mind goes. It makes me a little bit scared. But let's get into this article. So here, this one was written by Science Alert, but many news outlets have covered this specific story. And what we're looking at here is the skeletal remains of a female, quote, vampire were found in a 17th century Polish graveyard with the sickle across her neck to prevent her from rising from the dead. So a professor from Copernicus University headed the archaeological dig and led to the discovery of the remains, which were found wearing a silk cap and with a protruding front tooth. So let me go ahead and zoom in on this photo. Is that tooth noteworthy to mention in this article? Maybe, you know, in, in the more modern stories of vampires, we have these K, the, the canine teeth, right? They, they're a little bit more pointy, a little bit longer. But in this case, maybe in the 17th century, it was a different story altogether. Maybe if you just had one protruding tooth, that instantly made you a vampire. I don't know if that's the case, but that would really suck because braces weren't a thing back then. <laughs> so I'd be a little scared right there. But the sickle, as you can tell in this photo, was not laid flat, but placed on the neck in such a way that if the deceased tried to get up, the head would have been cut off or injured. In the 11th century, citizens of Eastern Europe reported fears of vampires and began treating their dad with an anti-vampire type of ritual, according to the Smithsonian Magazine, believing that some people who died would claw their way out of the grave as blood-sucking monsters that terrorized the living. Guys. Who is ready for the spooky season? Who is ready for Halloween? Uh, just like, you know what? Just literally all of October. We get really nice hot drinks. The, the leaves are changing color. I finally get to wear scarves and sweaters. And I can wear the same sweater for a week, which is fantastic. Because I only own like three sweaters. <sighs> and then you get to hear all these spooky stories. Ugh. Maybe be on a campfire and have some s'mores. I'm not a really big s'more person myself. What about you? I find them just a little bit too sweet for my taste because you get the graham cracker, you got a marshmallow, and then you have Hershey's chocolate, which between you and me, Hershey's chocolate and I don't really get along. I love chocolate, but Hershey's, it just tastes a little too fake for me. But aside from the s'mores, a campfire and some campfire stories, I'm all in. Uh, don't don't how does it go don't threaten me with a good time <laughs> i read that today and i said i'm gonna somehow incorporate that in the show because i really want to say that line maybe it didn't sound as good out loud as it did in my head but we still said it but so far from the story that we're covering today on strange paradigms what do you think about this we do need to keep in mind that in the 17th and 18th centuries there was this type of really just a huge fear of vampires, what they would classify as a vampire epidemic in across Europe, where they were burying people in a very specific way. They were killing people thinking that they were vampires. Um, it's, it's a little shocking. I don't think I would want to be alive during those times with this type of huge level of fear when it comes to maybe they were just regular people right, who were classified as vampires. I did get one comment on the short that I did oh, like two days ago where someone had mentioned um, maybe this woman just didn't go along with a man's advancements and the man then accused her of a vampire. And then right after that, it's, it's game over. Could that have been the case? Maybe. We don't No, it's unfortunate that she wasn't buried with a diary, but it's it's really fascinating. It really, really is. But let's see. I want to see what you have to say about this before 
We continue. David says, I have a stack of Hershey bars in the freezer. Awesome. Oh my gosh. Frozen chocolate. Mm, so good. I put, I know Kit Kats and Hershey's are like the same type of chocolate. I do like Kit Kats. I love putting them in the freezer. Wow. It's, it's a game changer. It's so delicious. Oh, Hyde says, I'm going to Mothman Festival next week. Bring on the spooky. Oh, yeah. That kind of sounds like fun. I think this year, I don't know if it was this year or in 2019, they pulled about 20,000 visitors. I had just read an article today about it, and I wasn't sure if I was going to cover it. But I had saw that number. That was the amount of visitors that they're either expecting to get or that they got in 2019. Heinz, if you know the answer, please let us know in the live chat because I want to know that. That sounds that sounds awesome. And like all, I don't know if there's like food attractions there, but there should be like Mothman flavored, not flavored candy, but like Mothman shaped candy. That would be really fun. As we continue with this, other ways that um, archaeologists have found how people in that time period have attempted to prevent people coming back from the dead states that other ways to protect against the return of the dead include cutting off the head or legs, placing the deceased face down to bite into the ground, burning them and smashing them with a stone. So, though other common anti-vampire burial methods include a metal rod hammered through the skeleton, the remains in Poland were found with the sickle across the neck and a padlocked toe to restrain her. So, the padlocked big toe attached to the skeleton's left foot likely symbolized the closing of a stage and the impossibility of returning. Ah, it's a, here's another photo. It's not of the same skeleton, but it is another one that archaeologists have found in a different location, but it's the same setup. You have a skeleton and you have a sickle just going right around the neck, but not going through the neck yet. It's not unless they wake up from the dead and then their head will be cut off. This is a common practice during this time in Poland in the 17th century. It's a bit spooky, but I like it. I like I like these types of stories because we gotta get we gotta get ready for the spooky season. We're officially in September. Halloween's not too far away from now. We gotta ease up with these kinds of stories. Last week we not last week, but the week before we talked about clowns. And we talked about the haunted amusement park. Pretty spooky. This year, talking about vampires. How in modern times, like literally present day, when people from my generation, and maybe just a little bit older, when they think of vampires, they think of Twilight. And between you and me, don't tell any people, don't tell anyone in my class, but I've actually never seen Twilight. I've heard such bad reviews about it that I've never seen it. I've never read the books, but have any of you seen the movies or read the books? And did you enjoy it? Or what are your thoughts on the movie? It's plural, it's a series. And when you when you hear the word vampire, what's the first thing that comes to mind for you? What what's the first image or the first memory that you might possibly have when you hear the word vampire? Or maybe it's even a color. Maybe you you think in colors or you think in numbers. Let me know if the color, number, memory, or image you get when you hear the word vampire. <laughs> Laura said, no, I haven't seen Twilight either for the same reasons as you. <laughs> I just never really really bit into that kind of like romantic y supernatural stuff just never really cared for it <laughs> less sweet says saw a pumpkin sitting on a doorstep yesterday that gonna be rotten mush long before october yeah i went to the grocery store a few days ago and i'd already saw like this line of pumpkins just right outside of the 
at the supermarket and I'm thinking, who's going to be carving pumpkins now? Yeah, it is not going to last until October. If anything, it's going to be gross. It's going to be attracting all these flies and gross bugs. Maybe we'll get that um, zombie fungus. For those that follow all of our strange paradigms, a few weeks back, we spoke about a zombie fungus, which... which um goes inside of flies and cicadas and as soon as it eats up the inside of these bugs it bursts out and you have this fungus that had to incubate in the bug body for it to grow and in a sense blossom that's why it's called the zombie fungus and oh my goodness is it so grody (laughs) but also very cool so now when i see things that are rotting or if i see a dead bug That is the first thing that comes to mind is the zombie fungus. Mm. Cool, but I wouldn't really, I don't know if I would want to be there to witness it like protrude out of the bug. I'll pass. Mm. Vash says, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. That one, that one's better. That one's a lot better. Now I can't compare it to anything because I haven't seen the Twilight Zone, the the Twilight twilight i love the twilight zone grew up on it that's how i became interested in all of this strange and the mysterious is because of the twilight zone but when i'm comparing buffy the vampire slayer to twilight never watched twilight but i really do like buffy great a little it's a little corny at times but you know you you, you gotta gotta enjoy those moments Brian says, old Dracula movies, either black and white or little color. So that's the first thing that you think of when you hear the word vampire. (laughs) Sarah says, I can't finish the first movie, but I'm on a Hollywood hiatus. Dan says, Buffy as well. Yes. (laughs) Interesting. Khalid says, once I hear vampire, I smell a funny smell in the air. It is amazing how our brains work. And they're all, in a sense, slightly different. Yes, there are similarities, obviously. But when we... We all have these different senses, right? Where some imagine things, some taste things things some hear some smell when they hear a certain word or they see a word for myself um i i kind of see it in like freeze frame that that's me i don't really smell anything i don't really see colors i don't really taste anything for myself it's usually i just see a picture and that is how i interpret my thoughts (laughs) donna side said says i do have a buffy tattoo though very cool i want to see a picture of that let's see what else oh deranged lunatic thank you so much for the super sticker i really appreciate it ufo man you also rock buddy too much information so good to see you here my friend let's continue on to our next article And there's a few times on Strange Paradigms that we've spoken about snakes, and it's come up yet again today. So let's take a look at this photo. Okay, what are we looking at? We're looking at a snake that choked on a centipede. Ah, It's a bit weird. It is kind of, we're gonna, we're gonna get into that. But first, Ian. Hi, Christina. How are you today? Hello, Ian. So good to see you here, my friend. I am doing awesome because I get to hang out with you live on Strange Paradigms, talking about all the strange news. So you know what? I couldn't be happier to be here today. Are you guys enjoying this? You guys having fun? You doing well? Let me know. Let me know in the live chat. So here, this this snake that you're looking at right now is North America's rarest snake the rim rock crowned snake this one was recently spotted in a park in the florida keys after a four-year hiatus well this would normally be cause for a celebration (laughs) the snake sighting was more a source of awe than anything else because this snake was found dead 
locked in lifeless combat with a giant centipede as it managed to swallow it halfway. So the fatal duel marks the first time that scientists have observed the snake's eating habits. Closely related species are known to have a preference for centipedes, but this rare snake is so rarely seen that until now, no one had any definite idea of what it ate. Researchers at the Florida Museum of Natural History created CT scans of the interlocked pair and published their results in the journal Ecology. So this was definitely something that no one expected at this museum to see. One, it's already a very, very rare snake. And then they see it eating something that they could have expected, but then that they both died. As we continue, Coleman Sheely, the Florida Museum's um, collection manager, said, I was amazed when I first saw the photos. It's extremely rare to find a specimen that died while eating prey. And given how rare this species is, I would have never predicted finding something like this. We are all totally flabbergasted. I really like that word. Flabbergasted, it just, it just sounds like an awesome thing to say, especially when you really are, <laughs> for instance in this situation. So the most obvious explanation, given that the centipede was one third the size of the snake, would be that the bug cut off the air supply of that snake. But snakes are known for gorging on prey much larger than themselves, because unlike human jaws, and other vertebrates, which are directly attached to the skull, snake jaws, here's another photo, snake jaws are held in place by flexible ligaments and muscles that allow them to wrap their heads around their food. So that's why this is a little bit shocking, especially when it's coming from a snake where he really or she, this snake really did die while eating its prey. But the The researchers here at the Florida Museum did do CT scans um, and they, the CT scans are public. You are able to see them. And like I said, at the very beginning, you can find all of the links to these articles in the description box below. Once this live show is over, I will place all of them there. Okay, I am going to create a poll now. Let because I I you know I really enjoy creating polls for you, making it super interactive. So which do you find more scary? Snakes or centipedes? Which one do you find more scary? Sever, thank you so much for the super sticker. I really appreciate that. Sarah says, at least it eats centipedes. Yuck. LOL. (laughs) Yeah, Ian. Thank goodness it's not an anaconda. Imagine if an an anaconda choked on a centipede. Imagine how big that centipede would have to be. I'd be mortified. I would not want to be in that vicinity. No, thank you. Because centipedes are already kind of spooky. All all those legs, you know, they, they, they make my hair stand up too many legs for me name says beautiful thing about living in alaska no snakes (laughs) too funny so for those watching this live please go on the poll and let me know which one you find scarier snakes or centipedes (laughs) xyz says in australia everything is scary the amount of jokes i've heard about australia when it comes to their creatures it's insane i think the most popular one and please correct me if i'm wrong but i think their most popular one is like it's satan's playground or something like that um and the the bugs 
and the creatures that are found there are ginormous. And yes, they are very scary. <laughs> Mm. All right. Well, while you go ahead and answer this poll, I have a pretty fun next article for you. So as many of you know, many returning viewers and listeners, at some point in almost every show, I mention food. Have it be an article or have it just be random or have it be Jimmy sharing with us his favorite ramen recipe with chili. Whatever the situation, food always comes up. And for those that are Patreon um, supporters, we do have a Patreon extras. So at, for all the interviews that I do on Shifting the Paradigm, there is, in, there is a Patreon extra. It's called The After Show. And there I ask very fun, very lighthearted questions to my guests. And then a few extra questions as well related to their field. But I somehow always bring up food. And then me and the guests can usually spend a good 15, 20 minutes talking about like one recipe. Now, we never let it extend that long. But when I talk about food or literally when anyone talks about food it just sparks this interest in a lot of people so this next one is pretty interesting and it's about dumplings how many of you like dumplings i love i love dumplings i will try every flavor once cuz why not but just the concept and they're just like these cute they're like they're like Asian tacos. <laughs> they're not. They're not at all. But if I had to explain it to someone that doesn't know what dumplings are, I would say they're like Asian tacos in a slight sense, but literally not at all. Well, here is an interesting one, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. But while I do that, those in the live chat, oh, do you like dumplings? Do you think they're delicious? I do want to know. Let me take a look here. Oh my goodness. Happy birthday, Rene. That is so awesome. Happy, happy birthday. Do, 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 do. And you are chilling in the Philippine Islands. <laughs> nice. Hopefully, you are treating yourself well, having a nice whatever food or drinks that you enjoy i hope you're splurging because it's your birthday happy birthday and thank you for spending it here with us here on strange paradigms i feel honored hola how is it going icaro hola cristina de este lat hello it is so awesome to have an international audience here where we're getting people from all over the world to watch these shows. It it humbles me. So I, I do want to say thank you for all of you amazing viewers and listeners. Jessica, thank you for always supporting. It says... For live fun and mysteries on the road for your dreams to become reality. So you need RV fun. Here's some help. Keep up the great work. Thank you so much. Yesterday, I was looking at RVs. I, I have I have my eye on a few models. And uh, as soon as it is purchased, you all will be the first to know before my parents because my parents still have no idea that I do this. Now, I did inform them that I was going to get an RV. They have no idea why. <laughs> They're just like, oh, yeah, she just wants to travel the country. And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly why. And like, touch on all the ufo hotspots and the paranormal hotspots i haven't told them that that part yet not until after i graduate then they'll find out and then, and then they'll be you know big fans of the show too until then it's it's our little secret so before i continue oh james but you still made it i'm so happy you made it james you're a little bit late but that's totally okay so we got maca says yes dumplings barry says yes john aside Love dumplings. Yep. Asian pierogies. Roller City, that is a much better way to describe it. Yes. Yes, definitely like pierogies. I never had them. I know what they are. I've seen them in the freezer section, freezer section at the grocery store, but I have never had the pleasure. You know, it could also be like ravioli in a sense, right? 
dumplings could be like ravioli. Anyways, let me, this is all leading up to a really peculiar article. I'm going to share my screen here. So the very famous dumpling brand created dumpling flavored soda. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's been classified as probably Japan's worst tasting soft drink. <laughs> so, um, Gyoza traditional pan fried dumplings are a staple of Japanese cuisine, but they are also the inspiration for one of the world's most bizarre refreshments known as their brand of cider or their brand of soda, as some Japanese news outlets have been calling this drink. Originally launched in 2019, Gyozo Cider has been making news headlines and going viral on social media ever since due to its unusually faithful dumpling taste. <laughs> Let me continue with this article. So upon opening this bottle, right? You are reportedly hit by a unique smell that has been described as a mix of chili oil, vinegar, soy sauce, garlic, and ginger. The smell is so strong that a representative recently told Japanese news website JTown that he advises people to open the bottle outdoors. So apparently, the makers of this crazy concoction never had deliciousness in mind when working on it. They just wanted to reproduce the taste and smell of their very famous dumplings and possibly make people curious enough to go ahead and try it. <laughs> well, let's hear what you have to say before I even continue. I'm craving a bubble tea now. Bubble tea is good. TMI said, yuck. <laughs> Roller City says, I'm sure I've had worse. <laughs> oh, geez. They also have turkey gravy soda. No, thank you. No. Crab cola is next. Gross. <laughs> well, for people that have tried this very interesting drink, have said this. One Twitter, one person on Twitter wrote, it was sweet at first, then the garlic and ginger taste of the dumpling hit my throat all at once. Someone else commented, I drank it after a meal and then vomited. So what's... <sighs> So apparently, the taste of this bizarre fizzy drink is beyond bad, and most of those who have tried it only recommended it as a cruel dare or a way to show off one's strong stomach. So you have to admit, dumplings in liquid carbonated form, it does sound, it does sound gross. But what is more gross. A few weeks back, two weeks now, we talked about Oscar Myers creating a cold dog. So a frozen version of their corn dog made out of like ice cream and sugar and stuff, which is very grody. So what sounds worse? Oscar Myers cold dog or this dumpling flavored soft drink? They both sound terrible. But imagine if you had them back to back. So unfortunately, this drink is currently only sold in Japan. And for some other um, stores that might carry Japanese imported items, it's usually classified as sold out. But if you were given the chance, wouldn't you try it? Or would you go for it? <laughs> Jessica says, that's the most disgusting flavor I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> David Potter says, I'll, I'll just have a lemonade. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Hyde says, I once tried to eat a pickled pig's foot. 
anything that's pickled is a no go for me. Nothing except. Yeah, nothing actually. I don't like anything pickled, but it is, it is too comical. But here, here's what came to mind. Oh my gosh, actually hides like imagine all the pig poop that that foot stepped in right when you were eating that oh okay S skipping on to that when i was reading this article one thing that came to mind was the game and it's it's like a type of game called bean boozled and i'm going to share my screen here and what we're looking at is the jelly bean company that created this interesting game where you don't know what kind of flavor you're going to get. Are you going to get lawn clippings or lime? Are you going to get rotten egg or buttered popcorn? Because they're created the exact, I mean, they look the exact same, but the flavor is disgusting. You also have baby wipes flavor, moldy cheese, stinky socks, and skunk spray. I've been a victim to this game. I played it in high school. And I I was the lucky one. I always got lucky. I never had a bad flavor except for buttered popcorn, which is I think is disgusting, but it can't it's less disgusting than rotten eggs. But I during that game, I had a friend and we all dared him to eat like the whole box just to eat all of the jelly beans in one go. He threw up. Yeah, he ate all of the jelly beans in one go and he threw up. This is a fun game. It, are these delicious? Absolutely not. But it's to laugh at your friends in this situation. Did you get lucky or did you grab the barf jelly bean instead of the peach flavored one? Have you played this game before? I think it is very fun as like an icebreaker game. Like if you're on I don't know, with your kids and they bring friends or vice versa, or like both of you are parents and you have kids that I've never met. This is a fun game to play. Just make sure not to eat all of them at once because yeah, you will vomit. <laughs> but let, let's, let's quickly hear uh, from the live chat. Have you played this game? Would you play it? Scarface gave me the pukey, the pukey emoji. Sarah says no pickles. Sad face. <laughs> Hyde says, can dog food? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Earwax was a bad one. Uh, they're all gross. They are all grody. But again, I think it is fun to play uh, at least once. All right, let's jump over to our next article while we still have the time. Hopefully you're enjoying these. This one is pretty peculiar. Here we are looking at, and I'm going to share my screen just as a visual aid for you. This was also excavated by archaeologists um, right next to Malaysia. Here it is, uh, like Malaysia and, the, um, and Indonesia. And here it's a 31,000-year-old serious surgical procedure. What? 31,000 years ago? No way. Well, at about this time, a skilled prehistoric surgeon cut off the lower leg of a child hunter gatherer right next to Malaysia. Now, archaeologists have concluded that this ancient surgery is the earliest medical amputation on record. So the skill of the Stone Age surgeon was admirable. The patient went on to live an additional six to nine years after the surgery due to a um, radiocarbon dating performed by the researchers of the individual's tooth enamel revealed that information. And this was according to a study published in the journal Nature. So one bioarchaeologist said, it was a huge surprise that this ancient forager survived a very serious and life-threatening childhood operation, that the wound healed to form a stump, that they then lived for years in mountainous terrain with altered mobility. 
An international team of archaeologists discovered the youth's skeletal remains inside a limestone cave known as Liang Tebu on the on the Indonesian part of land during an archaeological excavation in 2020. So the cave is remote and accessible by boat only at certain times each year. The skeleton's lower leg, including the foot, were removed, though deliberate surgical uh, amputation and telltale bony growth related to healing suggests that the limb was surgically amputated and not the result of an animal attack or some other tragic accident, according to the statement. However, archaeologists haven't determined why the child's leg had been amputated. This is fascinating information because prior to this find, the earliest evidence of an amputation on a human involved a 7,000-year-old skeleton of an elderly male Stone Age farmer whose left forearm had been surgically removed according to a 2007 study published in the journal Nature Proceedings. That's a big difference. This newest one was 31,000 years old. And then the the prior, the prior oldest one was only 7,000 years. That is a huge gap in time where even 31,000 years ago, it seems as if they had some medical knowledge on attempting to do surgery. That's impressive. That is impressive. <laughs> Patrice says, what a goat. For those that don't know what goat means, it means greatest of all time. <laughs> just just want to mention that. <laughs> I learned that word my senior year in high school. I was like sitting next to all these football players in one of my classes. And, I, and they're like, yeah, goat. Yeah, you're the goat. And I'm looking at these kids and I'm thinking, why are you saying such mean things to our teacher? <laughs> What does this mean? And they're like, you don't know. I mean, it's greatest of all time. And I said, okay. <laughs> Thank you for that information. It's pretty funny. It's funny now. It wasn't funny then. <laughs> yeah, it does not mean goat man. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out, Patrice. It's very important to mention, especially in this community, right? You think of goat, you think of goat man. Yeah. Well, here, Going back to this article, um, it is hilarious. No, not 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 the article, but what um, Pat Reese said is just very funny. And I, I lost my train of thought. But before that timestamp, scholars thought that humans lacked the knowledge and tools needed to successfully perform complex surgeries, which often involves navigating a network of blood vessels, nerves, and muscles. However, this finding reveals that humans must have had detailed knowledge of NIM limb anatomy and muscular and vascular systems to expose the veins, vessels, and nerves to prevent fatal blood loss and infection. Before I became part of this community and before I started looking at like ancient civilizations, specifically Gobekli Tepe, for instance, I never gave our ancestors that much credit when it comes to knowledge. But if we're looking 31,000 years ago and they were able to have at least the basic knowledge of how to amputate limbs without dire consequences or extreme blood loss is incredibly, incredibly impressive. And it makes me question, how did they get that knowledge? How is that knowledge lost? thousands of years later, where we practically had to relearn all the things that our very ancient ancestors were already familiar with. We had this golden age, we had this time of forgetfulness, and then we're having another type, in a sense, of a golden age once again. But that gap in between, I want to know what happened. And to keep in mind, to, to give people a little bit of a reference, 31,000 years ago, people were still doing cave paintings. That's kind of like when it, in a sense, began to start. 
<sighs> Unbelievable. David said, use the bat signal. <laughs> Scarface says, humans found drugs, LOL. <laughs> Jessica says, that's the big mysterious question we all want to know. Yes, ma'am. We definitely do. Jumping over to our next article. The in in honor of the passing of Frank Drake on the 2nd of September, let us talk about his famous Drake equation that looks for the that looks for potential alien life in the universe using math. And for those that aren't familiar with him and his story, hang tight because we're about to cover it. Let me share my screen here of Dr. Drake and his very famous equation right behind him. In 1961, U.S. astrophysicist Frank Drake, who passed away at the age of 92, came up with an equation to estimate the potential life in our universe. The Drake equation, dating from a stage in his career when he was too naive to be nervous, as he later put it, has become famous and it bears his name. This was created, as I just mentioned, in 1961 to serve as the agenda for the first meeting on the topic of SETI. In 1960, Drake had conducted a pioneering search for extraterrestrial science. Whatever reasonable values you feed into the equation, as you can see here, it's hard to avoid the conclusion that we shouldn't be alone in the galaxy. Drake remained a proponent and a supporter of the search for extraterrestrial life throughout his days. But has this equation really taught us anything? We're going to get into that. What I really, really want to emphasize was that he created this equation in 1961. We didn't really find our first exoplanet since the 1990s, the, like since the very early 1990s. That's a 30-year gap where people just kind of threw the conversation of aliens in the air and be like, nope, we're really the only solar system that we know of. Therefore, aliens aren't a thing. But he thought otherwise. And I find that just unbelievable for that time period. Drake's equation may look complicated once again, as we can see on the picture here, but its principles are really rather simple. It states that in a galaxy as old as ours, the number of civilizations that are detected by virtue of them broadcasting their presence must equate to the rate at which they arise multiplied by their average lifetime. So putting a value on the rate at which civilizations occur might seem to be a type of guesswork, but Drake realized that it can be broken down into more trackable components. As Drake himself noted, his simple formula can be likened to how you might estimate the number of students at a university. All you need to do is consider the number of new students, freshmen, entering each year and multiply that by the average number of years the students will spend at the school, that would be about four years, and voila, you have a good estimate of the total number of undergraduate students. That was a very simple way of how he explained it. So when Drake first formulated his equation, the only term that was known with any confidence was at the rate of star formation, about 30 per year. Very fascinating. And as for the next term, back in the 1960s, as I had mentioned, we had no evidence that any other stars had planets. And in one in 10 may have seemed like a pretty optimistic guess. However, observational discoveries of exoplanets that began in the 1990s and have blossomed this century now makes us confident that most stars do have planets. 
So it seems that that Dr. Drake was way ahead of his time when it came to this equation, when he didn't really have a lot of this background knowledge that we do today. And I guess in a sense that we might take for granted now. Now, this looking at exoplanets, this equation is very uh, important. It is very beneficial to our conversation, those that are very interested in the UFO phenomenon. When we have science backing us up, when we have math backing us up, nothing, nothing can stop us, not anymore. So we are all so grateful to have this equation, to to have Dr. Drake be a part of this earth for the 92 years that he was here, which is incredibly impressive, because he made this conversation looking at the possibility of extraterrestrial life more plausible. And this was happening in the 1960s. Unbelievable. What do you think? Do you think, do you think this information is important today and even then? Barry says, well, now that James Webb will change that number again, it, it will. It will. <laughs> That's right. The famous Drake equation that we hear pretty often in this community. Have it be in podcasts, have it be in lectures, have it be in documentaries. We usually hear the word Drake equation at least once. <laughs> so I thought it would be nice to share it with my younger viewers and listeners that may not have known the story behind it or really what it meant, because I think this information is very important. Jumping over to something a little more spooky. Paranormal investigators were so freaked out in the UK when they heard what they thought was a growling goblin. <laughs> Let me share my screen here. Dun, dun, dun. Sharing my screen. Okay, here we go. Here is an image of where two very specific paranormal investigators went to by the name of Vic Harbert. He was 70, he is 76. And Christine Towand, who was in her early 30s, when early 50s when this happened. And this took place um, at St. Lawrence Church. And they were with members of the East Yorkshire Research Group. And the reason to why they went to this very specific location was because there were rumors of alleged goblins that roamed the ground. And this story was covered by the Mirror UK. And as I had mentioned at the beginning of this show, we got to get ready for the spooky season. So we're doing that now. Something a little, something a little spooky. <laughs> and this one is a, is a pretty bizarre story. And I really would love to hear what you have to say to this. And if you were in their shoes, what would you do? So keep that thought in mind while I read you what happened to these people. So Vic said he had a spirit box with him, which he likened to an electronic Ouija board, while Christine was carrying a dictaphone. So they told Hull Live that when we entered the location, we said, is there anyone there? We don't mean you any harm. Please come forward. Then Christine said, hey, did, did you hear that growl? And Vic looked at Christine and said, what growl? At that exact moment, the growl actually moved and he began to hear it. And what did he do? Well, he walked towards that growl because he is courageous. And then he heard two very loud bangs. It gets even weirder. Vic took a photo of the moment. And he said that he saw in that photo a head in the window that looked like a demon, to be honest. 
that looked like a demon. What do demons look like? Well, I think everyone has their slight own interpretation of what they might think it may look like. But in this case, he truly believed that he captured a photo of a demon and it was rather spooky. Christine gave more detail on the spooky night in question, and she said she could immediately sense an eerie feeling when they entered the church grounds. I've come to the realization that trusting your gut feeling is rather important. For those that aren't familiar with my story, I borrowed a vacuum cleaner from a student my freshman year in college. And I took the vacuum cleaner into my car and I just felt like something was really off. Something just felt wrong. But at that point in time in my life, I'm thinking, you know, I don't really believe in gut feelings. Nah, they're they're just kind of BS. Turns out, uh, this is a very fast forward, fast version story. I brought the vacuum home. I left it in the corner of my house. I used to have a candle in my bathroom and it's a very heavy candle wrapped it like in a glass jar and it fell. I put it back up and it fell again with absolutely no explanation, like no explanation whatsoever. There was no earthquake. There was no weather anomalies. Nothing was going on. This heavy one pound candle fell on its own the moment I brought this vacuum with me that I had a bad feeling about, but I dismissed my bad feeling because I really needed a vacuum because when you're in college, you just don't have money to buy a vacuum. (laughs) Well, turns out it only got worse in my situation. I started playing some music, some music that said that it, that it, dispels evil entities and I heard this screaming screech come out of my speakers at that exact moment I picked up the phone I called that girl and I said hey yeah can I can I return your vacuum she's like no no don't even worry about it just carry it until the next day and I said no please please I I don't need it anymore she's like no just drop it off in the morning so I put it in in my tiny little storage unit outside and I said look Whatever you are, you are going to stay there. You are not going to disturb my my beauty sleep. Okay, you? And I'm going to return you first thing in the morning. When the sun comes up, you are going back to your owner. And then I never spoke to that woman again. Um, and ever since then, I began trusting my gut feelings. They're very important. So I'm very happy that Christine here had said that she had this very eerie feeling to it. If you do want to hear the whole story to this haunted vacuum, as Jonas side had mentioned, I've mentioned it in multiple interviews. You can find all of my guest appearances on my website at strangeparadigms.com. And there you can just hear the whole story in detail because it's funny now. It wasn't funny then. So as we continue with this story, let me show you what the paranormal investigators look like. Here's a picture of them. Very cute people. So she had added, you know, I I seem to pick up things. There's just these weird feelings. And I turned to Vic and I said, this tree is really giving me the creeps. It's just really freaking me out. And then... They kind of brush it off. The rest of the team kind of brush it off. But she stood next to this tree. And then she heard this growling sound. Not once. Not twice. Not thrice. But four times she heard this growling sound when really no one was nearby. By the fourth time she heard the growl, she's like, I can't believe this. That there is there is no way. I thought this might as well just be ridiculous. Well, At that moment, by the fourth growl, Christine said that she then looked down at her feet and saw something translucent moving from the ground. Here is that picture. I don't know if I shared it, but I'm sharing it with you now of the um, Vic and Christine. And eventually, Vic also heard the growling sound. And he walked towards the tree, the, the the tree, and walking over to this creepy sound. And when I was looking closer to this tree, 
it stopped. So Christine believes that something came up from the ground and then went back down again. Keep in mind that the reason to why they went to these haunted grounds, to this haunted abandoned looking church, is because there were alleged stories of a goblin roaming the area. Do goblins growl? I don't know. Would I go? Absolutely, I would check it out. And if I were to hear a growling sound, I would make sure I have my recorder on, make sure to have a Polaroid camera or a regular camera going, taking taking as many pictures as I can, because I'm going to capture that evidence without a doubt. But the fact that she was able to see a translucent thing, right, moving up from the grass and then back down. Have you heard of any goblins that that are, in a sense, invisible, that are able to go through objects or go through the ground? I haven't. I'm not too familiar with goblin stories. I do love puck wedgies, not, not because of the actual entity. I just really like the name puck wedgies and i do want to attempt to bring it up consistently throughout my shows because it's such a fun name to say puck wedgie puck wedgie it's just so cute i would like to mention before we go ahead and continue on to our next article Anyone who wants to continue the conversation once this show finishes, you can join me in my Discord server. It's free, it's fun, it's friendly and secure. Talk about your paranormal or your UFO experiences. And there are a lot of different room topics. So you'll find so much interesting information there to talk about to, to talk about live with. So I will put the link in the live chat now for those that want to join the after show chat with all of us fun kids. Mm, Jonaside said, goblins, no. Elementals, yes. Sever says, ghosts have goblins. Daniel, do goblins have ghosts? It's worth considering. The same question with Bigfoot. Are there Bigfoot ghosts? I want to know the answer to that one. Thank you so much, Brian, for the super chat. I really do appreciate that. So going on to our next article, but one more thing that I do want to mention before we continue is this these people right here, because the rest of the team didn't encounter what Vic and Christine encountered. But to this day, they're not 100% sure what happened that night, what was really going on. And hearing, hearing these growling sounds are a bit spooky. So if you were in their shoes, what would you do? Let me know. And I'll read it out loud because I would love to hear it. Hyde says, imagine if they had a thermal camera. Be a game changer right there. You got to make sure to have all the equipment. Got to have everything. But you got to make sure to know how to use it and how to use it quickly. Right? Because sometimes these encounters are only a blink of an eye. May I speak about an encounter I had as a little girl? You absolutely can. You can here and in the Discord server as well. There is a room where you can talk about your experiences and where people have shared their experiences as well. We all want to hear them. Uh, once again, it is a friendly, safe, and secure community. We all want to hear what happened to you as a child because i think a lot of us have had pretty bizarre encounters that either we don't talk about or we brush off as children and it seems that paranormal encounters are more prevalent than people expect them to be especially when we're dealing with children because it is believed that children are a bit more sensitive than adults when it comes to the paranormal and the strange so yes, I'd love to hear your stories. Marty says, um, I would leave. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a, a, a growling goblin sounds a little scary, just a little bit. But then if it can turn invisible, or what if it's a goblin ghost? Maybe a little bit less scary. As I had spoken with 
um, when I had Dan Terry on Shifting the Paradigm, who is a retired chief of police and now a paranormal investigator, him and I agreed on the same thing, that it shouldn't be the dead that we should be afraid of. It is the living. And I think that when we deal with uh, ghosts and the paranormal, it, overall, it's not always the case, but for the most part, they can attempt to scare you, right? But they can't physically hurt you often. It's very, very rare. But people, they hurt us all the time. Happy they punch us in the face. They make us trip. They hit us with their car, right? They poison our food, for instance. So it should be the living that we should be afraid of, not the dead. And if you haven't watched that interview with Dan Terry, I recommend that you watch it on Shifting the Paradigm, which is on my channel right here on YouTube and in all podcast formats. You will find that interview to be able to get a glimpse of someone that has a law enforcement background who then became a paranormal investigator. They have a different trained eye to these things than maybe your average person. So some of the encounters that he had were honestly unbelievable, but very, very cool. XYZ says, maybe it's a uh, growl speech, growl back, bring some food so you can make it a pet. Always bring snacks. You never know. Maybe the reason to why they're terrorizing you, maybe the reason why they're chasing you, just because they're hungry. They're hangry, right? You know, wh how does that commercial go? Bite into a Snickers because you seem a little hungry, something like that. Same kind of vibe. Same kind of thing. But we have some more time left. Let's go over to our next article. And I'm cleaning out my laptop here so that I do not get confused. Okay, on to our next one. How many of you know what tardigrades are? They they sound, they're like, oh yeah, they're water bears. They're super cute. I don't find them cute at all. A lot of scientists do. A lot of people that have done research into tardigrades are like, oh yeah, they're super cute. I don't see it. They look like squishy dementors from Harry Potter with that type of mouth and no eyeballs. Oh yeah, they're super cute. No, I don't see it. But why are we bringing this up today? Well, there was a very interesting discovery on tardigrades. You see water beards, cute little beasties, nasty beasts. I don't think that's related to tardigrades. <laughs> water bears. Yeah, we're consistently seeing water bears now that are super cute. I don't see it. That's just a, a personal preference, I guess. Hmm. Oh, Daniel, thank you. You agree with me. He says, I don't see it either. See cucumbers. Well, uh, Marty says, well, if they were the size of elephants, not so cute. I agree with you, Marty, on that one. <laughs> Let's talk about these. I would like to mention that the size of a tardigrade is one millimeter. To give you a little reference point, if you pull out your credit card from your wallet and you turn it to its side, that's one millimeter right there. Or if you put 10 sheets of paper on top of each other, that is one millimeter as well. Those things are tiny. They're, they're tiny little things. I first learned about tardigrades in um, Star Trek Discovery. Just want to mention that. I, that. That's where I first learned about them. Great TV show, by the way. But here in this article, researchers have discovered another trick. These chubby microscopic water bears used to survive years of extreme dehydration. They can live to about possibly two decades without water. That's changes a lot when it comes to looking for, for extraterrestrial life or microbial life out in space to where we think that you need water 
to thrive, to grow, to have all these different types of species. And yes, you do. But it seems that with tardigrades, which are here on planet Earth, they can live for about 20 years without water. That is unbelievable. So many of the 1,300 known species of tardigrade tolerate conditions that would be fatal to all other known life forms. Starve them, boil them, freeze them, radiate them, or fire them from a gun. And these distant velvet worm relatives will just keep coming back for more. It goes to show that life can thrive really no matter what. And these, quote, cute water bears is a great example of that. Are they cute? No, not in my opinion. But they are pretty spectacular. So when these aquatic animals find themselves in an environment that leaches away their water, tardigrades shrivel into a round form called a tun. T-U-N. So a fellow University of Tokyo biologist and colleagues explain in their paper that dehydrated tardigrades are exceptionally stable and can withstand many extremes, including exposure to the vacuum of space, and still manage to resurrect themselves. What? What? Unbelievably spooky. Um, it is rather intense. And what we're looking at here, or as this paper continues, it states that the scientists are beginning to look at how is this even possible? What what are they creating? What proteins are they creating to go ahead and live such long periods of time without water? Well, they found this protein called cytoplasmic abundant heat soluble, which are unique, only unique to tardigrades, and they're responsible for protecting their cells against dehydration. If you want to read the article in more detail, I, as I had mentioned twice already, I will place the link below for you to go ahead and read it in detail because it, it, gets, it gets pretty intense on the science aspect on how they found this information. But when I'm looking at this, it's, it's wild. Dope No says, it's my birthday. It's my birthday. My mom got me an ancient aliens hat. Oh, that's so cute. Happy birthday, Dope Nose. Happy stinking birthday. It seems like you and Renee have the same birthday, which is uber exciting. And an ancient alien's hat. You better wear that with pride, buddy. That is awesome that your mom is totally with it and your interests. Happy birthday, friend. Happy birthday. Yeah. Getting a lot of happy birthdays. That is so awesome. <laughs> Jessica says, tardigrades and the TARDIS, hmm, connection, begs the question, anything is possible. Ah, oh, gosh, the TARDIS. I love Doctor Who, but like David Tennant is my favorite Doctor Who. I think, I think I've only watched three, four seasons of Doctor Who. After David Tennant, I kind of dropped it, but oh. Tardises, yes, I want one. It, unless maybe I already have one. Who knows, right? I gotta find all the time to do all these things. Hmm. Hey man, happy birthday. Awesome. This looking at this article, looking at tardigrades, as I had mentioned at the beginning, and I'm gonna mention it again because this is so significant. We are learning things every single day. Science is always expanding. Exploration is always expanding. Looking and, and finding new things, it's always something new. And if tardigrades can live in extreme conditions, even in the vacuum of space, can even live without water for more than 20 years, 
life can flourish anywhere. So we can't have this narrow scope when we look at things saying, oh, there's no water. Nope, nope, life cannot be there. Oh, there's no oxygen. Nope, nope, life cannot be there. Because that's no longer the case. And in the same sense that before the 90s, people thought, no, nope, there are no exoplanets. Nope, it's just us and our solar system and stars. That's all we got. That's it. And that has changed so much to today. We find a new exoplanet every single day. And now with the James Webb Space Telescope, those numbers are skyrocketing. We live in incredibly exciting times. We're seeing such huge advancements in our science and also in our exploration as well. It is, it is a very, very cool. But in some respects, it can be a little spooky. Why is that? Well, it seems that Chinese company appoints AI-powered virtual robots as a CEO. Yes, Chinese metaverse company NetDragon Websoft recently made history by appointing an AI-powered virtual humanoid robot as its CEO. Thoughts? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Let me know in the live chat. Let me know in the comments. Think about it for a second. Here is just a visual for you. The new AI-powered CEO, known as Miss Tung Yu, will reportedly be at the forefront of Fujian NetDragon WebSoft's organizational and efficiency department, overseeing operations at the technology company valued at almost $10 billion. The board of NetDragon WebSoft apparently believes that artificial intelligence is the future of corporate management. And the appointment of Ms. Tung Yu is a symbolic commitment to embrace the use of AI and change the way the company does business. A press release from Wet Net Dragon WebSoft reads, Tang Yu will streamline process flow, enhance the quality of work tasks, and improve the speed of execution. Tang Yu will also serve as a real-time data hub and analytical tool to support rational decision-making in daily operations, as well as to enable a more effective risk management system. In addition, Tang Yu is expected to play a critical role in the development of talents and ensuring a fair and efficient workplace for all employees. In the future, the Chinese tech company plans to expand the algorithms behind Tang Yu to create a highly transparent management model as NetDragon WebSoft transforms into a metaverse-based working community. Founded in 1999, Wet Dragon WebSoft is one of China's most respected video game developers, having worked on successful game titles, including, including Heroes Evolved, Conquer Online, and Under Oath. No detailed information about the AI-powered CEO has been revealed so far, but the controversial news has sparked a heated debate on social media around the concept of machines taking over humans' jobs. Interestingly, in 2017, a popular Chinese entrepreneur, Jack Ma, publicly stated that, in 30 years, a robot will likely be on the cover of Time magazine as the best CEO. So I guess we're starting to see that. What do you think about this? Is this a natural evolution when it comes to these types of companies? Or is this just outright absurd? Is it scary? Is it exciting? Let me know in the live chat. It's, um, it is rather, for myself, I'm not really sure how I feel about it. I think in some respects, I expected, I expect something like that. But in other respects, it is a little bit scary that we're having a 
and AI make the decisions for us. But that's already happening now with Alexa, with Siri, with even in some regards, Google, when you look up certain information that tells you how to do something because you don't have the knowledge or you don't have the parents or grandparents to tell you how to do it. So it was going to happen, but it's happening a little sooner than I could have expected. That's right, Patrice. It's happening with ads. It is. It is. Michelle says, Christina, do you know anything about Banshee? I had an encounter with one as a little girl with my mother's dad was living with us on hospice dying of cancer. She appeared to me in my bedroom floating. I'm not too familiar with Banshees. Um, to my understanding, they do have a negative connotation. Uh, I haven't looked into them that much yet, but I definitely will with some of our future shows. But that is... That's a pretty peculiar encounter to have, especially as a child, where do you know, I mean, did you know what was going on with you? Could, what, what was your young mind thinking at that moment? I'd like to know. David asks a, a very valid question. What happens when it doesn't come on? The <laughs> AI CEO. I guess everyone can have a vacation for the day, right? And they just go home, relax, have a cup of tea. <laughs> They're like, oh, that's not open. Especially if it, they want to have their community in a metaverse type of world, right? If if the power's out, if the internet's not working, oh, because I'm not going to work today. <laughs> Marty, this is a very good point to make. He stated, I assume that AI robots would not have an ego, hence potentially better. Yes. Well, if they want to make them as human as possible, such as Sophia, where they have desires and wants and dreams, it might be that ego could possibly be inevitable. So at this point in time with our basic robots, yeah, they have no ego. They just do the task and then they, they finish their task. But in the future where we're having a CEO that has to make these big decisions, for instance, they would have to weigh the pros and the cons. They would have to have wants and desires. And with wants and desires comes along ego with that. But hopefully, hopefully that's not the case. Hopefully that isn't the case at all. All right. I have one more article for you. But before that, when I'm reading your comments here, something that I would like to, to mention that it's sparking a thought in myself is that AI might develop a sense of self-preservation. And that could get dangerous. That is when we need to start worrying. So I have one more article for you, ending it on a high note. How many of you have heard of Spain's giant Tomatina food fight? This was news to me. I've never heard of this. I'm going to share my screen because we have some pretty interesting photos here. Let's share this. Take a look at this. Why are they all red? Well, that is tomato juice, tomato pulp, tomato skin, tomato seeds, tomatoes. <laughs> Here's another photo right here where they're having a very fun tomato fight. And this is the 75th anniversary. So people from around the world paced each other with tomatoes last Wednesday, August 31st, at Spain's famous Tomatina Street tomato fight. Workers on trucks unloaded 130 tons of overripe tomatoes along the main street of eastern town of Boñol for participants to throw to their friends, leaving the area drenched in red pulp. Up to 20,000 people 
were there to take part in the festival, paying 12 euros a ticket for the privilege. The town streets are hosed down and the people are also hosed down as well. And <laughs> this battle is only an hour long, starting at noon. This tomato fight is located in a tomato producing region. How did this even start? How did this festival of throwing tomatoes even become a thing, having it be the 75th anniversary this year? Well, here's how the story goes. During a uh, pretty boring street parade back in 1945, a street fight broke out when one rowdy local started to pelt everyone <laughs> with vegetables from a nearby market stall. A group of young people retaliated and a huge food fight broke out. The following year, the same people picked a fight on purpose and brought their own supply of tomatoes. Although the police broke up the new tradition for a few years, and then it was later banned in the 1950s at the height of General Francisco Franco's dictatorship, the popularity of the food fight lived on and the tradition was eventually brought back. Media attention in the 1980s turned it into a national and international event, drawing participants from every corner of the world. People wear swimming goggles to protect their eyes, while their clothes, typically t-shirts and shorts, are covered in tomatoes. <laughs> Would you join this festival? I mean, keep in mind that tomatoes are naturally acidic. So imagine how your skin might feel. Maybe slight burning. Maybe definitely wear goggles if you are going to participate in this. But what's very interesting is that tomatoes apparently keep you clean. Tomatoes are a natural disinfectant, meaning that after this festival, your skin will be cleaned of impurities. And the town is also surprisingly clean with firefighters, firefighters hosing down the streets and people after the one hour battle. <laughs> but we do want to keep in mind that it's not just this event of throwing tomatoes for an hour, but it is a week long event filled with parades, fireworks, and paella cooking contests on the streets of the town, which if you haven't had paella, you're missing out on life. It is so good. It's like yellow saffron rice with seafood. Oh, I'm, I'm drooling right now. It's, it's so delicious. But would, for my last article, having it be this one, please answer this in the live chat, and I will make a poll as well. Would you join this tomato throwing festival? See, tomatoes are naturally pretty hard. But as I had mentioned at the beginning of this article, these are overripe tomatoes. So they're pretty squishy. They're pretty soft. But 130 tons of tomatoes. Wow, that is a lot. So would you join this festival? Would I? I don't know. Probably not. Marty says, ew. <laughs> no way. I get you on that one. I get you on that one. So I'm making that poll now. It is very difficult for me to um, speak and to make a poll at the same time. But would you join this tomato festival in Spain? Yes or no? Zeno says, yes, love Spain. Motivational Mind says, yeah, I would. Aw, John aside, I am so happy that you're feeling better, my friend. Is that pictures from the Red Wedding? No, these are recent pictures from last Wednesday. Okay, the poll is up. Answer the poll for those watching this live. Yes or no? Would you join it or not? Of course. I'd be the center of the fray. <laughs> Rock on, Daniel. Jessica, yeah. Hard pass. Hyde says, when I was young, sure. Yeah, some people definitely have a really hard throw. So you better duck and dodge. 
like in the movie Dodgeball, because it sounds like it might be a little bit painful, in my opinion. Nah, I prefer mustard. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. That's funny. David, th this is a valid point. Wait until you get a tomato seed <laughs> growing under your eyeball. That's why That's why people that go there often wear goggles and like snorkeling gear to not get it in their nose and their eyes because they don't want tomato trees growing out of them. Tomato vines. They're not trees. <laughs> Plants. Sever says, sweep it up and have salsa after. It's probably like full of dirt and like sweat. I'll pass. Surf Psych said, yep, Kurt, yeah. I was waiting for someone to make this reference. John aside, I'm happy it was you. You can dodge a wrench. You can dodge a tomato. That's from the movie Dodgeball, for those that don't know the reference. <laughs> <laughs> well that is all the time that we have for today Ika Rose says fun but I don't agree with wasting food okay this is an important thing that you mentioned that I that I do want to bring up there were other countries that went ahead and followed this trend Canada India and a few countries in South America but as the government's got a whiff of it and they realized the amount of waste that was being produced they banned these festivals keep in mind that here in Spain in this town in particular it is a tomato producing town and they do only use overripe tomatoes so ones that are like a about to go bad so yes i agree that that sense of waste kind of sucks but they have an, an a hugely abundant amount of tomatoes apparently where they can just throw 130 tons on the streets pretty crazy mm. motivational mind says add to the fertilizer for next year's harvest oh yeah see that that's smart smart motivational minds well, that is all the time that I have for today for these articles. L which one was your favorite that we covered today? Which article that we covered on episode 18 of Strange Paradigms was your favorite? <sighs> Mine, you know, I really liked the soda one because it's just so grody. The dumpling soda. I, I like I like the really strange kind of funny ones. While we do cover the science, we do cover the paranormal, we do cover the UFOs, which we didn't cover today. The the extra goofy ones are kind of my favorite. But let me know in the live chat or in the comments, or even just think about it for a moment. Which one was your favorite? Jonaside said the water bears. Oh yeah. Um. If you are new here, check out my channel. On Tuesday on Shifting the Paradigm, we had John Greenwald Jr., Jr., the owner of the Black Vault. Then on Thursday on Mysteries with a History, we did the Mysteries of India Part 2. So we cover three shows a week, every single week on this channel, along with daily shorts, which are very short informational videos that you get practically every day. Next Tuesday on Shifting the Paradigm, I'm going to have Ben from Uncharted, a researcher in ancient civilizations. We had an incredibly fascinating conversation. I learned so much. You do not want to miss that show on Shifting the Paradigm at on Tuesday at 5.30 p.m. PST. Make sure to hit the notification bell on YouTube so that you do not miss any content that we create here. Follow me on Twitter at eyes underscore on the skies to catch all of my news and show updates. That's the best place where I post everything. So check me out there. But also all of my social media links are below TikTok, Discord, um, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and all the podcasts, and my website at strangeparadigms.com. You can find below. If you want to continue this conversation, bring it over to the Discord server. I want to chat with you, hear your thoughts, hear your opinions on absolutely everything. 
thank you so much to everyone watching this live, all of the moderators, all of the Super Chat, Super Stickers, YouTube members, and Patreon subscribers. This simply could not be possible without you, and all of the funds that come through this channel go straight to the RV, which is coming sooner than later. I'm so excited. You have no idea. So I want to wish you all a wonderful week. Be safe. And remember, keep your eyes on the skies. Mm -hmm.